I mean, I guess while we're waiting, um, if anyone has any kind of random questions about uh, myself, where I fly, I fly with Shiva Corporation at the moment. We are um, part of Initiative Mercenaries. We're formerly of Morsis Mihi, which was one of the power block alliances in Nelson. Where is your corporation station now? Uh, we're currently fighting in the north. Um, initiative and Initiative Mercenaries, the Initiative family, is a mercenary coalition working under Raiden at the moment against Goon Swarm. So at this very exact moment, actually, I'm actually cloaked up in hostile sp- space after 2,000 men more that just went on. <laughs> That's pretty epic. Uh, it's not epic. Did you start this one as well, Zero? Huh? No, I didn't start this one. The one I started was much smaller. But, uh, yeah, this one had, what, I think it peaked at 36 Titans, um, 40-something super caps, and, like, I don't know how many dozen carriers, and then about 3,000 drakes come and go. People died and more people came. I'm trained primarily Galente, but uh, what type of ship should I be aiming for if I'd be interested in going up in uh, NALSEC PvP? Um, it depends who you're flying with. Different corporations and alliances run different doctrines. Some will run Alpha Doctrines, which will focus around using Minmatar projectile boats mostly. A lot more have started using the new time dilation fits, which are more focused around lasers. So Omar is good there. Um, Keldari is becoming a lot more popular with the Rook, and the Tengu has been a, a long-staying uh, stable, and of course the Drake. The um, Some of the, the race, I mean, pretty much every race offers something in the way of utility in the form of recons and logistics. So in that sense, even if you are primarily Galente, you will be able to find room as an Aneros pilot or as a Lachesis or Razu pilot in just about every fleet. Gotcha. I mean, no matter how high the Alliance sets their bar, there's always room for every race as long as you've trained the right kind of things they're going to need. Why did you pick Shiva? (laughs) Um, I've got a lot of friends at Shiva. It was was a bit of a coin toss between Shiva and Fairlight Corp of, um, of Rooks and Kings. But uh, ended up coming here. Shiva's got just as broad a history as a lot of these, and you know, it's a bunch of fun guys. We're actually a lot of us almost exclusively live on the uni forums. We're in the null stack section quite often. So if you want to catch us trolling in there, a small reminder to any member that does drift into that section: keep an open mind. <laughs> yeah, we're kind of friends. We, we don't like rules very much in there. Okay, um, I think we've waited long enough. Ken, did any of them say they were coming? Or? Uh, they seem to be uh, right in the middle of fleet action, I suppose. Uh, I assume, because of, I'm not getting much of an answer. That's uh, fine. Okay. Oh, I've got an answer there. They're stuck playing docking games for now. You may as well start. Alright, that's fine. Okay, guys. Uh, if you fire up the presentation I've linked to all of you, I'll link it one more time in lectures.uni. I'll link it once on the link. The Google Documents presentation should be fairly easy to open up. Alright, let's get started. Uh, the topic of today's lecture is going to be effective target management. Uh, this is first in a three-part series of lectures on fleet command that I'm going to be giving to EVE University over the course of probably the next couple of weeks. Uh, the idea is basically introducing a lot of the very introductory ideas behind fleet command to get you in the right mindset on what you need to think about when commanding fleets. 
Um, when it comes to actually commanding fleets, it's there, there's no hard and fast rules. Situations change, opportunities vary, and a lot of it is just thinking on your feet. So what we're just going to be touching on is a lot of the basic things that you're going to be thinking about when you're making those decisions. So if we turn over to the first slide, uh, this lecture is sponsored by the Shiva Corporation. And uh, just a little bit of PR there for my guy. Okay, the summary. A brief lecture and discussion on understanding targets and the role of the fleet commander in selecting the appropriate ones to destabilize the enemy force as quickly as possible or to achieve another objective. This will be followed by a question and answer session. Now, uh, basically, you've got a couple of objectives when you're calling targets. When you go into any engagement, uh, you have the option to inflict as much damage as possible, i.e. you're killing your enemy. You have the option of ending the engagement as possible, uh, as, as in taking out the core objectives, uh, the pivotal role ships, stuff like that. A lot of the case, uh, a lot of the time, sorry, this will just be killing enemy logistics, it will be killing tackle, uh, it will be killing fleet commanders, if that's what you want to do. If you want to draw out an engagement, you'll probably stagger your kills to sort of even out to keep the enemy on the field as long as possible. Um, it, uh, again, it, these things will vary according to your actual thing. Now, we're, we're basically going to start discussing the different types of targets, so let's go on to the next slide. What is a target? In a nutshell, a target is any legal target that you can attack with uh, within the rules of the corporation or coalition you're flying with. With EVE University, that is sometimes an RDS, it's sometimes NBSI, uh, it's sometimes war targets. Uh, the legality of a target often dictates the kind of force you're going to be able to bring against it. If you're in low sec, you're not going to be using frigates against, you know, minus tens because you're going to get aggro and uh, you'll end up losing people to gate guns and stuff like that. Similarly, if you're in null sec um, and you're fighting a single frigate, it might not be a good idea to aggress all of your larger ships on a single target because it prevents your ability to escape uh, in a pinch from that system within the next 60 seconds because of aggression timer. So identifying the target is very important. What is the target? What is the appropriate response to the target? Is the target worth killing? If the target is worth killing and it satisfies that criteria, go on. So what makes one target better than, better than another target? I mean, if you've got more than one guy to engage, how do you pick? So let's go to the next slide. The value of targets. You can categorize your target into a couple of core things to look at. Um, these aren't in any kind of list of importance. It's sort of just things you'll think about all at the same time. So tactical value is the target you're going to be selecting of tactical importance. You know, um, if your objective is to shoot a pause, are you going to be focusing on that pause? Or are you going to be chasing the defense fleet that's trying to defend that pause, trying to cut you away from it? Uh, if your objective is to take down a territorial claim unit, will you be killing the carriers that have sat, sat next to that claim unit as bait? Or will you be focusing on that claim unit before it goes online? I mean, it... Again, just the objective is, is crucial, and nine times out of ten, it is going to be the deciding force on what you're going to engage and what you're not. Moving on to the other things, though. Um, sorry, I kind of skipped slide there. Uh, your ability of your fleet to effectively neutral, neutralize the target. Um, sometimes you don't have to kill the target. Sometimes you'll have targets on the field that can be neutralized through other means. Uh, if you're facing, say, 10 Minmatar ships and a single Kildari one, and you happen to have Kildari Ewar hanging about, and you can jam that Kildari person through the entire fight, that effectively eliminates them from the, com the, uh, the competition. You don't have to worry about them immediately. You can do if you want to, but you don't have to. Uh, similarly is the case of ships with weaker DPS, you know, can your logistics render their, them useless? Is it maybe something that's going to be, you know, muting your ships out, stuff like that. Moving on to the value of a target uh, in terms of ISK, um, this is something that's more in line of uh, null sack and roaming gangs and stuff like that, where when you take an engagement to the enemy, you try to kill their most expensive ships first to boost your economy, 
um, uh, your efficiency on the kill board. The more you kill uh, and the less you lose, you know, the better it looks at the end of the day, and you come out the victor. So taking the value of enemy ships into consideration is often something that's very, uh, very keenly attributed and appraised. Uh, then you're looking at the value of a target to enemy fleet composition. Is the target a fleet multiplier? Uh, a fleet multiplier is basically something, um, it's called fleet multiplier, force multiplier, it's got different names. It's a, a vessel that carries more than its own weight within a fleet. Uh, for example, you've got logistics ships, which have the ability to repair your chart, your, your fleet members. You've got electronic warfare vessels, which have the ability to shut down enemy ships. You've got command vessels, which pass down massive bonuses and more often than not will contain the enemy fleet commander. Um, the value of a ship to the enemy fleet composition is sometimes very critical when you're making a decision on whether a target is worth shooting or not. Uh, then we've got the target's danger potential to your fleet, either direct or indirect. Um, in the direct sense, danger to your fleet would be ships that have very high incoming DPS. For example, if you enter the field and you're facing six drakes in the Macarial, just off the bat, the Macarial is the most dangerous ship there because of the very high amount of DPS it can put down on you guys. Um, that makes it the most dangerous target on the field. You have a choice. Can you shut it down in a different way, or are you going to make that your primary target? Uh, similarly, you have indirect threats. Indirect threats are enemy electronic warfare. Um, you've got enemy um, warp inter interdiction folks. So you've got dictors, hictors, uh, tacklers, interceptors, stuff like that. And that easily leads on into the relative ease of the target being removed from the field. How easily can you kill a target? Um, you know, more often than not, if it's just an interceptor, kill. But you can't kill an interceptor if your own fleet consists of just battleships. You know, how are you going to target them? So a lot of the time you have to be very, very careful when assessing the value of a target and your fleet's ability to neutralize them. Um, if they are able to be neutralized, then you can call it. If they're not, then it could be a very wrong call and you could be making a big mistake. So let's move on to the next slide. So using the principles we've already discussed, you've picked a target. You decide that in that fictitious gang of six drakes and one Macario, you want to primary that Macario. How will you broadcast that target to your fleet? How will you convey it to your fleet? Um, there's different ways that people use to convey targets to, fleet, uh, to their fleet members. Uh, one is using the actual broadcast function within EVE. Uh, you can pick a target off your overview, right-click it, and broadcast it as target. It will show up in the history tab under the um, the fleet as a target with the ship type as well. It's usually followed by the fleet commander announcing over voice comms in some way, shape, or form that a target has been identified. Um, a lot of alliances operate a very strict sense of operational security where they don't repeat the name of the target uh, on open comms because of fear of spies listening in. And it happens so often that it's it's unbelievable. You'll call a target, and that target will al already be receiving reps before you've managed to fully target him, primarily because the enemy already knows who you're calling as a target. So some of the different ways someone would call a target is, let's again use the example of the Macarial, and we'll use Kayan as the, the target, shall we say. So if I was calling Kayan as a target, I'd say, guys, Kayan's primary, Kayan and the Macarial is primary. Or I could say, guys, Kayan is primary, or Macarial is primary, K-E-I is primary, or K-E-A-E, -E. I forgot how to spell. Anyway, you get the point just basically hinting towards the right target and the existence of the right tar target is uh, is one way that a lot of people will go. A lot of people won't bother at all. They'll read out the entire name. You get some hilarious pronunciations. Um, it's one of those cultures that has led a lot of people to name their alts after really awkward things that a fleet commander would have to say. For example, primary warp out now. Is, uh, is something that I've heard called for a character called Warp Out Now. And uh, in some ways, it, it could confuse someone. It's very unlikely, but I guess it's more for comedic effect. But it's there. 
there's different ways that FCs will convey themselves to their fleet. Uh, some FCs use a very calm demeanor for anyone that's had a chance to watch the um, the Clarion Call videos, for example. Lord Maldorar of Rooks and Kings is a very calm and calculated target caller. He very systematically goes through his list. Then there's some that are slightly more harried, uh, slightly more hurry, uh, you know, in a bit of a Adrenaline, ad, adrenaline rush. If you've heard people like Shadu, for example, if you've heard people like the Big Red Boat of Goon Swarm, if you've heard Sister Bliss from Initiative, a lot of these major FCs use, use a slightly more adrenaline fueled way of calling targets. And finally, there is using fear, which is trademarked, and that is absolutely raging, raging at your fleet. Um, th- the things you'll hear from some of the veteran fleet commanders is just astonishing. Um, it makes me laugh, but people with more sensitive sensibilities will probably cry. It's, it's just some of the things are ridiculous. But that's an option that's there. A lot of people find it's very effective to put the fear of God into your fleet mates because they listen to you. Others find it more compelling to instill a sense of responsibility in their fleet mates, um, giving them very clear orders and, you know, just reminding them of their basic responsibilities. And uh, let's move on to the next slide. So keep them coming is the the title of this slide with the, that little picture that I found on the internet. You need to minimize the downtime you have between target calls. Um, it's enough sometimes that you've called a primary, but other times you'll need secondary targets, you'll need tertiary targets, and you'll need to cycle through them. It's, it's critical that the fleet commander, when he's calling the targets, is keeping an eye on those targets and the way their health bars are moving. Uh, if a target's getting repped, you know, it might be time to stop shooting that guy. If a target is dying really fast, make sure you have a secondary target ready to call. Uh, you want to minimize the downtime between your targets so that you keep your guys firing as long as possible because the more downtime you have between your shots, the more time the enemy fleet has to get more shots on you. Uh, inevitably, a time will come when your fleet commander gets popped. Uh, sometimes it happens at the very beginning of a fleet. Sometimes it will happen five minutes into an engagement. It's critical to have a chain of command established. Whether the chain of command is known or not known to the rest of your fleet is irrelevant. The chain of command needs to be there, and the people that are supposed to take over should know that they're supposed to take over should you go down. Um, it, it can't be stressed enough. There always needs to be a head to the beast. If the head's gone, the bottom crumbles. It's always been like that and always will be like that. Let's go to the next slide. Do not panic. Keep calm and keep shooting. We've discussed a lot of different types of targets and different ways to assess targets, different ways to call targets. It's a lot to take in. And to be very honest, a lot of it will not come to you at that critical moment when you are calling your first targets or your second targets. Um, in the the rush of, you know, emotion, sensation, the adrenaline, the fear, you're not going to remember a lot of the things we've just discussed and you're just going to call targets off the bat and that is perfectly fine. As long as your guys are shooting, you can always adjust targets later. Front and foremost is to not panic, keep calm, keep shooting. You know, it's fine if you kill a stupid target first as long as you switch to a better target later. Let's hop to the next slide. Knowing when something isn't working, so your target's not dying, and you're losing more guys, what next? Uh, you've got a couple of options. What usually happens is fleet commanders will call switches and targets. They'll say, right, okay, that one's not dying, let's switch to that target. Maybe that one will go down faster. Um, if that doesn't work, sometimes it's time to exit the field, and that is the responsibility of the commander as well, to convey to his fleet that the engagement time is over, and it's time to move on. It's time to get out of here. And again, that's something you're going to have to learn to deduce on your own, gauging within, you know, the five split seconds you have to assess if the fight's going your way or not. Let's go to the next slide. Using your support effectively, uh, the use of reinforcements, waiting black ops units, specialized warfare groups, and capitals. 
Your support is often going to be critical. Um, your hand and showing it is often going to be the deciding factor in victory. Very rarely will you have just the five guys you're taking. Even the very simple con- the concept of baiting with a single ship is, in a way, you know, hiding what you've got on the other side of the gate. Using your support effectively and using the composition of your fleet to its full effect is crucial. The better understanding you have of how to use your ship to its full potential ability, the uh, the better your results are going to be on the field. Once you gain a broader concept and understanding of how different types of ships works and uh, how various types of engagement works, engagement ranges, weapon types, you can start dictating more how your engagements will operate. Using black ops units is often very, very profitable. You can shut down enemy fleets. Um, you know, you can position key units at warp out points for the enemy. Almost everyone likes to warp to the sun at some stage during a fight for a bounce. I don't know why, but yeah, the sun is a great place to catch people trying to run from combat. Um, you've got specialized warfare groups, asymmetric warfare, and, um, you know, guys that just specialize in covert stuff. And uh, it's it's critical that you, you work with the greater concept of the fleet as opposed to just what you have right then and there. Um, capitals are going to be one of the, the final things you're going to start to command. Uh, it's essentially a very, very strong control of your super fleet if you're going to be deploying capitals to the defensive capitals and the supportive capitals is often critically decided on, you know, a few split-second decisions. Um, A very basic way of defending your capitals is to have sufficient force available to lock down any heavy interdictors or interdictors that are going to try to stop them. And uh, it's just one of those things you sort of grow into understanding. So a lot of the perspective I've been telling you about is from a slightly larger fleet uh, perspective. Um, EVE University typically runs fleets, you know, between 50 to 100 members. That's fine. Um, when you move out to NALSEC alliances, you'll find fleets that actually hit the 250 hard limit. Then you'll find them working with other fleets that are also at the 250 limit. Um, eventually, you'll find yourself in fleet engagements that rage, range in the many hundreds. Um and, you know, the thousands is the next step. It's it's scales, and these concepts stay regardless of the scale. But the smaller the engagement gets, uh, the more crucial it becomes that you know the difference between targets. Because in a very large engagement, you can afford to keep calling incorrect targets and still score successful kills. But in a smaller engagement, you're going to need to understand what is affecting your fleet the worst and eliminate that quickly. It becomes a far more faster-paced game of chess. And uh, very small situational changes will cause massive ripple effects um, towards smaller-scale combat. And that brings us to our final slide. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for listening in. It's been a fairly small class, but... uh, it, it covers effectively the the the, the topic of uh, target calling. Um, I did leave an extra hour here for anyone that wanted to ask questions and stuff. So go on ahead if you've got questions. You can ask them on comms or in lecture.uni. Either works. I have a question. Um, what's the easiest way of countering heavy um, logistics? Uh, the, the easiest, easiest way is to use electronic warfare. Uh, if you've got E-War, uh, ECM, ECM will shut them down. If you've got neutralizers in the form of various recons or neutralizer-heavy battleships like the Balgorn and such, then uh, you can lock down logistics very easily. A lot of doctrines will prescribe that all of their members have ECM drones in their ships, and as soon as a fight starts, the first thing the fleet commander has you do is put all of your ECM drones on various enemy logistics ships. And even though the jamming ability of ECM drones is quite weak, um, you know, one in ten attempts, maybe they will successfully jam a logistics ship, and that one in ten jam is still massive when you come to think about the scale of engagements.
Uh, Neutral Light asked a very interesting question, and uh, it's something that was on my slides, but for some reason I didn't cover it. So let me scroll back there and find where it was. Okay. Yeah, it was on slide seven. Minimizing downtime, uh, another topic to cover. Uh, there's different ways of organizing your targets, and uh, some FCs will, for ease, ask you to arrange your lists in different ways. You'll have different types of overviews. Some alliances use exclusive overviews designed to only show their targets. So, for example, you might have a battle cruisers only overview setting. You might have a frigates only overview setting. You might have a logistics only overview setting. And um, there's different ways to sort your targets, sort by range, sort by alphabet, you know, A to Z, Z to A. There isn't really a hard and fast rule why some FCs do it one way or the other. The reason a lot of FCs will use range is if their fleet engagement is constrained by the range of their weaponry. If you're using a short range, uh, using short range ships, you're going to be inflicting the highest damage to ships closest to you. And in that sense, using um, range as a sorting tool is very effective to know what is within range and what's not. Uh, Kara has asked, how does the FC keep an eye for effective target ranges the best way, especially if your fleet is not one big blob but spread out a bit? Kara, sadly, it gets really confusing sometimes. You'll have half of your fleet that is in range and half of them that won't be. Um, many times it's going to be a guessing game where you call a target and someone in your fleet will have to say not in range and you're going to see it from the uh, from the display of DPS. The easiest way would be through visual representation. Have a look on your actual, you know, brackets. See if you can see the target within range. If you can, then there's a strong likelihood you're in the right position. Dexter Nemdor has asked, do you have an idea what are the largest possible fights in EVE and is the limit set by the limited abilities to manage a huge fleet or by the game mechanics performance to handle such fights? Dexter, that's actually a really good question. Right now, I'm currently in Tinal, which is space held by Intrepid Crossing, I'm currently shifting to Raiden. Um, I was about 30 minutes ago involved in a 2,000-man fight in uh, in space here. And it gets to the stage where time dilation just kicks in so heavily that not much can happen. In the course of about 35 minutes, we scored no kills, but the kill boards show over 300 ships as having died. So it's, it's you know, the systems themselves will suffer heavily when uh, the engagements get to that size. But more, you know, the server kind of keeps up to an extent. I, I don't think we've reached a hard and fast stage where the server is just not going to be able to keep up. It used to happen where you'd just get node crashes because of the lag, but time dilation's done quite well in managing that. So far, we've seen 2,000 people in a single fight, and it's sort of managed to keep up, but, uh, it, you know, it'll change the more people get involved in this fight. Um, my Dean Ka has asked, in a Unifleet, even if your fleet is all in a blob, since Unifleets are kitchen sink, half the fleet might be out of range regardless. Yes, my Dean. Uh, the second part of this series of lectures is going to be on doctrines and effective doctrine usage. The thing with doctrines is that more than anything, it gives your fleet commander the ability to correctly gauge the capabilities of your fleet. If you're all running close-range, high-DPS ships, your fleet commander will very accurately be able to know that you know targets out to 20 kilometers are going to die, but things further out are probably not. If you're all running high-alpha, long-range fleets, your fleet commander will know that he needs to take the engagement to 100 kilometers plus to be effective in combat still. Um, that's where Doctrines comes in. Uh, with Unifleets and Kitchen Sink Fleets, often it's just a case of, you know, trying to find sufficient targets where you can engage them and hope for the best without focusing too much on the actual finer points of the engagement. Uh, with the Unifleets, 
I would personally suggest, and this is what I always did as an FC in Eve University, was to sort targets by range and try to eliminate the closest ones first. And um, more often than not, you're going to have more people with the ability to strike at close range than you are going to have people with the ability to strike at long range. So it usually worked out. Kara asks, don't people turn off brackets in many large fleet fights? Yes, Kara. Yes, they do. Turning brackets off is almost essential. Um, again, that makes it very difficult sometimes to gauge the position you have in regards to the enemy. Oftentimes it will evolve, involve aligning and following tow lines and anchoring on a specific individual. So your fleet commander will often say so-and-so person is anchor. At that point, that person who you should have on your watch list already, you just right-click their name and set, keep that distance 500 kilometers, oh, sorry, 500 um, meters, and just follow them around the battlefield as they move. And that usually keeps your entire fleet in the uh, in the same sort of train of movement. Neutralite asks, is using initiative a good thing in fleets, or should you purely do as FC commands? Neutral, it becomes a lot more important in smaller range engagements than it does in larger ones to use your own initiative. Um, your individual player skill comes into question a lot more because a lot more is being relied upon of you. The smaller an engagement, your personal contribution to the engagement is significantly higher than in a large scale fleet. You know, in a, in a large scale fleet with 200 people in your fleet, if one person isn't firing his guns, it will probably go unnoticed. But if there's 10 of you and one of you isn't firing your guns, that's 10% of your fleet DPS missing right there. So yes, initiative is important even in larger fleets, but not as important. Um, in larger fleets, most of your initiative will be focusing on making sure you cop you follow the right targets, you fire when you're told to fire, you anticipate the targets a fleet commander will want to take out. Often these are recon ships and tackle vessels. Um, enemy logistics tend to be towards the end because of the logistics abilities to keep themselves up with uh, with support. And um, warping out is crucial. You've usually got an align point. You've got a way to get out. You know, no one expects you to sit there and get your face punched in to the very bitter end. Dying quickly is, you know, lost ship at the end of the day. It's not a victory. Siranti O'Larry asks, do corpse usually have... Sorry, could you... On the job training. Oh, on the job training for fleet commanders, or is it more trial by fire? Um, a lot of places don't have training for fleet commanders, and that's the sad truth. Um, you get people who have natural flair and potential for fleet command, and they sort of foster together and get better at it. You've got people who are established fleet commanders who will occasionally take someone under their wing, but there are very few establishments with hard and fast fleet commander training programs. Um, Eve University would probably be, be my recommendation as a place to start if you want to start training yourself for fleet command. The pure reason being the fights in Eve University are just that. They're just for fun. They're just for fights. Um, once you leave, the scale changes. You know, everyone expects you to win a lot more. It's not just about learning anymore after that, so the pressure increases as well. Another excellent place to probably hone your fleet command skills would be Agony Unleashed. I know they run a program, and um, they're very supportive of people that do want to learn how to command fleets. But again, that's very focused on smaller scale combat, and if you want to start getting into the larger scale engagements, it's often just play it by ear and get to know it better. Uh, Roman Manowski asks, do you need brackets off if you're zoomed all the way out so it's not drawing modules, the models? Um, Roman, I'm not sure, to be very honest. Uh, I've always found that the first thing I do about an hour and a half before the fleet starts is make sure all my brackets are turned off or all my primary brackets for vehicle models are turned, or for ship models are turned off, um, and only keep, you know, planetary, uh, brackets on. It's, it's, it really, it, I would imagine it would still have an effect on lag, 
but there's no way for me to accurately give you information on that at this time. Any other questions? Yeah, a bit off topic. Um, how do you turn the brackets off? There's a couple of ways to turn it off. Probably the easiest is to click on the little options menu for overview and go to hide all brackets. You can specifically tailor your bracket profiles from your overview settings. And I think the shortcut is Alt, Shift, and X to turn your brackets off. I'm not positive on that one, though. Someone might want to correct me. Is it Alt Z? I think for the primary brackets, it's Alt Z and then Alt Shift X to turn on and off spatial brackets. Right, right. Okay. Any other question, guys? Um, yeah, you know, feel free to ask questions about just about anything. I know a lot of you have been uh, a little bit more curious about the uh, the kind of stuff we get up to as well. And I did expect a few more questions about, um, you know, living out in null and stuff. Uh, neutralize, neutralize asks, in large scale fleet fights, to missiles lose, do missiles lose out over turrets in terms of being able to put down damage? And are, and as the fight persists, if this is relevant. Um, with time dilation, missiles travel a lot slower now, but the converse of that is that when they do impact, it's harder to gauge the the time, you know. Uh, previously, you'd be able to sort of estimate that, okay, if this missile travels at 7 kilometers a second and the target is 10 kilometer, you know, 10 kilometers away, then the, the, the missile will reach them in about a second and a half, and then another quarter of a second while it does its little routine of circling the target before finally striking it. Um, as a rule, though, missiles tend to be a very different type of engagement. If you're using missile spam, um, expect your damage to come through slow. And in some ways, you do lo lose out in um, in the sense that you don't have the immediate damage that turrets provide. You'll be red boxed on a target, and they've got all the time in the world before your missiles reach them to warp out. Um, I've seen people who sit on the field until the very end, until the missiles are about 10 kilometers away from them, and then they warp out. Defensibility against missiles is also an issue. Um, a doctrine came out a little while back where battleships were used to screen from missiles and heavy missiles coming in by using smart bombs. And the idea was as the missiles came into engagement range, the smart bombs would be triggered and these would destroy the incoming missiles, thereby defending the entire fleet from the missile spam that was coming in. So, I mean, as, as the fight keeps going, um, it just, it, it's one of those things where it gets more and more irrelevant to the type of damage you're using because your fleet is focused on using what doctrine you are using to its best advantage. If you're using an alpha doctrine, you'll be alphaing ships. If you're not alphaing ships, you'll be switching targets. And uh, if you're unable to do that, then you'll be leaving the field. It's staying on the field when uh, when your presence there is no longer useful is probably one of the one of the things that a lot of people need to learn over time as well. Um Sakis K asks, who won in that thousand versus thousand fleet you were in before? It was actually eight hundred versus twelve hundred. Uh Goon Swarm tends to outnumber us quite significantly when we do fight. Um, we held the system, but in terms of kills, I think we came out slightly ahead. So we have won, but it was an extremely slow fight. Scientific and Eon Ending ask, in time dilation, how do logies know if they really are being effective, being so lagged? Um, that's a good question. It used to be the case where you wouldn't know. Um, you'd be triggering your repair modules and hoping for the best as damage was coming in on your targets. And this was in the lag days where sometimes your modules would lock up and you wouldn't be able to turn, turn your reppers off. You need to pick up and drag your modules around on your overlay before they'd finally free up again. And you could fire them. Um, but it's, it's a lot more apparent now from incoming damage and your logistical cycle time, the effect that your repairs are having on your target. 
Um, again, it depends on the scale of the engagement. Sometimes the incoming alpha will be so high that there's going to be next to no way to save the person you're trying to save. Other times you'll heroically keep up one person forever, but then, you know, the next person called primary will die so fast that there's no way to save. That's one of those things where, um, often logistics is a losing battle until the scale of the engagement tips. And once, you know, incoming damage sorts, sort of starts to stagger, the logistics ships start winning a lot more. Atash Zartosht asks, how would you suggest getting started with FSing, especially with the lack of roams in the uni right now? Uh, Kara very le- rightly has said, go to the low sec camp. Yep. Yeah. Um, there used to be a saying back when I was in the uni about, um, about six to seven months ago that, you know, if there's no fleet out, then you should FC. If you want to go out and fight, you should FC. Just take a fleet out, and that's about it. That's the only prerequisite there is for fleet command in EVE University. You've got a great beginner class to Fleets 101. You've got a very effective way of setting up fleets, even though it takes a very long time to get an EVE University fleet set up and rolling. But, uh, you know, it's there. Everything is there. You get your people moving, and you just go out and do it. It's It's the best way to actually learn. Scientific asks through Eon Ending again. Uh, so basically at that large a fleet and lag, it's whack-a-mole. Yeah, uh, when it comes to logies, it can become whack-a-mole. Sometimes you'll reach the target in time. Sometimes you won't. Um, when you do, it's a big victory for you. When you don't, it's not. It, uh, the logistics are the most hard-working people in your fleet, and often it's the most thankless job as well because you don't get in on the kill mails. But that's just the way of it. You know, you're the most important person in the fleet. When a fleet is forming, logistics are one of the first things that are called for because everyone can fly a damage boat. It takes a certain degree of selflessness to fly a logistics vessel. Okay, guys. Um, any more questions? What ship types are the most commonly used out in NALSEC at the moment? Um, there's a, a wide variety of ships that are used at the moment. You've got uh, Alpha Vessels, which are Maelstroms and Tempests. You've got Long Range DPS, which are the Tier 3 Battle Cruisers, the Oracle, most prominent among, amongst them. You've got the Keldari Rook, that's being used a lot more. Um, you're seeing the Drake having a bit of a revival. It's being used a significant amount more now. The Lachesis and the uh, Hugen are getting a lot of love because of their ability to uh, web and point to great ranges, respectively, while being decently to moderately tanked. So those are the recon vessels of choice at the moment. You've got uh, curses used to a minimum extent, but in, but in smaller range engagements. Um, interdictors of all races are used. Uh, command ships... Keldari are primarily primarily used, but uh, claymores and uh, broadsword. Sorry, yeah, claymores are very popular as well. Um, shield seems to be the primary focus for a lot of the skirmish fleets right now. They like to move a lot faster while putting out their damage. So shield tanked ships are the order of the day. But there's still plenty of armor tank fleets. You're going to get doctrines with um, Abaddon. You're going to get doctrines with sacrileges, guardians. Um, using, you know, the damnations and the absolutions as your boosters and stuff. Uh, Sakis K asks, what's the typical ratio between DPS and Logis in a fleet? Um, Sakis, I would say a perfect ratio would be about 25% uh, Logi to uh, others. Um, if one in four is a logi, that's a very good ratio. If you can get one in five, that's also not too bad. Realistically, you're getting one in ten a lot of the time, though, so about 10% is the realistic number of logistics a lot of people will feel. Uh, 
Eon ending and scientific ask, do you think CCP should find some factor to get logies on them without the typical drone whoring for kill mills? Um, CCP is saying that they're planning to do something about it. Um, they might be pl- planning to introduce remote rep as something very similar to remote sensor boosting and remote, um, remote, uh, tracking boosts in the sense that it uh, it shows those ships on kill mills. So uh, if they do incorporate that, then I think a lot more people will find logistics as a viable ship to fly. Kara asks, is the Talos used or does it not get any love? Um, the Talos is actually getting a lot of love at the moment with a lot of the Nullsec alliances. The... Yeah, someone was trying to contact me there about something random, and never mind. Um, yeah, the Talos is getting a lot of love in um, in a lot of smaller engagements as well as larger scale ones. It's very effective when used with rail guns, um, and it can hit out to very far ranges. We've got Talos, Naga, Oracle, and Tornado Doctrine that fire out to approximately 225 kilometers, and that's the engagement range we use. Uh, Serenity asks, so mainly Tech 2 and Tech 3 ships are used? No, that's that's not the case at all. Um, all of the battleships used are pretty much Tech 1. Battle cruisers are still used quite an often. Um, it's, it's pick and mix, really. Um, a lot of the alliances will have room for you all the time, no matter what you're flying. Now, if you can't fly what they're asking you to fly at the time, then you, you're you more than welcome a lot of the times just to bring an interceptor of some kind because there's still always a use for active bodies on the field. There's always going to be the need for someone to point a target. There's always going to be the need for someone to, you know, burn out a safe st- safe point, stuff, stuff like that. Saranti so asks, how long do you think is long enough in the uni? Um, that's a personal thing. It uh, it will depend on when you're ready to move on. For a lot of people, the the first indications you'll start getting is that the the rules and limitations placed in your university start grading on you a little bit. You know, you start feeling a little bit irritated by them. You start feeling that it's it's cramping your style, so to speak. Um, that for a lot of people, that's the first indication that okay, maybe this isn't for me anymore because I want to try other things. But it's not always the case, you know. Um, A lot of people will look at the place they eventually want to end up um, and plan accordingly. Like uh, Shiva, for example, has a 20 million minimum skill point requirement. We're going to be dropping that quite significantly um, in the near future because we're focusing a lot more on recruiting people who will fit in more with our ethic of being you know, talented PvPers as opposed to people who have, you know, advanced weapon upgrades 5 and are able to fit every single one of our fits, even though our fits are actually very difficult to fit some of the times. Um, I mean, almost none of our implant, uh, none of our fits work without an implant, regardless of what your fitting skills are. So it, it's, it's one of those things. More often than not, you'll have to look at how you're going to live, where you're going, um, if you're going to be able to sustain yourself, if you're going to NullSec, will you be able to survive? How will you make your money? How will you pay for your ships? Is your ships going to be paid for by the corporation you're moving into, or are you doing it yourself? Um, how are you going to plax if you're paying for it by cash? That's fine. If you're needing in-game money, where will you be generating that? A lot of the NullSec alliances actually are war-decked a lot more than uh, than even EVE University is. Um, we tend to be at continuous stages of war for probably months at a time, and uh, different corporations in high sex sort of cycle them, trying to catch, you know, the, the occasional person who comes to Jita and whatnot. So it's just one of those things. It, it, it really depends on you. If you feel you're ready to move on, you should start exploring things that interest you and, um, you know, and start sp- spreading some feelers and getting to know people in potential homes if uh, if that's what you want to do you know or there's there's always the option to go at it on your own <laughs> no worries guys um i was going to offer a small demonstration on uh, on target calling if you guys want that uh, i can show you a couple of different styles as well as my style 
If we're going to do that, okay, fine. Um, what I'm going to need, then, is for someone to name... Actually, if a bunch of you X up, so I get a lot more names in lectures right now. So I can update that list. Okay, that's good. Got a nice big list of targets there. Uh, now, could three people name a, a fairly decent ship? So just three ships. Okay, we've got three there. We're going to go with the Basilisk, Talos, and Tengu. We'll have the one Vexer. Okay, here we go. Um, some fleet commanders will call it like, guys, Atash in the Talos is primary, primary is Atash in the Talos, secondary is Cat's Manicus in the, Dan the Damnation, secondary is Cat's Manicus, primary is Atash, focus Atash. Um, some will be a lot more forceful, where, um, they'll be like, guys, primary is Atash, uh, A-T-A in the Damnation, guys, secondary is Cat's Manicus in the Talos, that's C-A-T in the Talos, primary is Atash, focus Atash, okay, switch DPS now to Cat's Manicus. Um, it'll be a lot faster, then there's some who are going to be screaming other, other types of words of encouragement, so there's going to be the guy who's screaming at you to be like, come on, more DPS, more DPS, kill it, kill it faster, go, 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 overheat your guns, overheat your guns, guys, align planet 2, align planet 2, keep your micro warp drives burning, come on. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, so, so there's different stuff. More dots, yeah, yeah, everyone knows more dots. Yeah, I actually, I get quite angry when I start calling, um, targets, and, uh, like, um, I was talking to Ken about it a couple of days ago where I went on this little shopping trip and ended up triggering, uh, a war that, that resulted in about a trillion escort of kills, all because I wanted to buy two rigs in hostile territory. You should explain that. <laughs> it's a funny story. Okay, so I was going through, um, I was wanting to fit a new ship out, right? And I needed rigs. And uh, the rigs weren't available locally. They were available seven jumps away in hostile territory. I was like, guys, does anyone have these rigs? No one was speaking up. So I was like, fine, I'm just going to go over there. So I hopped in my bomber. And uh, it was my Sino bomber, just as, as you know, fate had it. And um, I, bur I burned out there. And one jump out from target, I saw a friendly fleet getting a beatdown by um, an enemy maelstrom fleet. So I was on Mumble at the time with um, with some of our guys, and I hopped into a fleet channel, and I was like, hey, do you know that these these friendlies just got a, you know, a bit of an ass-kicking here? And they're like, yeah, we're forming on a Titan right now to uh, to go jump them. And I was like, oh, well, lucky you. I have a signer right here. I'm in system. And they're like, oh, excellent. So um, so I got into system, and I, we chased these guys around for a bit. We got a couple more bait squads in. And, um, and what basically happened was... Uh, our bait squad was engaged, so we had 10 guys who got engaged by this fleet of about 70, 70 maelstroms, and they started decimating the fleet. And the fleet commander had brought a Sino with him as well, and he was in his broadsword, so he bubbled up and he lit his Sino, and they pretty much melted him straight away. So, so imagine the kind of DPS that was coming in at him there. It just absolutely decimated him. And his Sino went down about five seconds later. And our Titan only managed to bridge in about five guys. And um, so I was like, right, okay, it's hero time. So I decloaked my bomber and I burned right into the middle of the maelstroms. Um, you have to be going less than 500 meters per second to light a Sino. So I killed my micro warp drive, started praying as the damage started hitting me, managed to finally light my Sino and 95% um, armor, and I started screaming over comms, you've got literally half a second to bridge people in. The bridge went up, another 10 people got in, and about a half a second later I popped. So I was getting quite agitated at this stage. So I warped to a safe, and I was like, God damn it, I need to find another ship. So I started looking for ships on the local market. Nothing was available. I mean, I can fly any cruiser, any T2 cruiser, um, any you know, T1, T2 frigate, and any T1 battleship, but nothing was available on the market. Finally managed to find one Mauler, so our fleets were all shield tanked. I was in this one heavily armor tanked Mauler with the warp scramblers and a Sino fit to it, undocked it, started screaming for someone to give me a warp in on the maelstroms. Someone provided me with a warp in, I warped in again, 
scrambled the two nearest maelstroms and lit the Sino. Um, this time they tried to alpha me and it, it just wouldn't hit me because I was, you know, I was just, I had so much armor, it was ridiculous. And um, we had more ships bridging in and um, we started winning the engagement. At this stage, the FC managed to somehow get himself killed again in his replacement ship. So he's like, screw this, and he jumps his Nixon. So he's like, yeah, I'd like to see them kill my Nix. So he starts calling targets from his Nix. Eventually, he's out of range. He's about 120 kilometers away, and there's maelstroms dying left, right, and center. There's no one calling targets, so I end up taking over as the enemy fleet are burning away from me. And I'm calling targets which are out of my targeting range, so I have no way of knowing if they're actually dying. So I'm calling targets. I'm like, okay, this is primary, this is secondary. Call points, guys. Someone calls points. I was like, okay, primary that guy. Tell me how his health bar is doing. What is the percentage? And someone's like, he's hitting structure. And I was like, good, finish him off. Okay, switch to secondary. And um, at this stage, like, people are just trying to talk over me at the same time because I'm out of range. And, you know, they're like, oh, you, you don't know what's going on. And I just start screaming over comms and swearing at them to just shut the fuck up and listen to me. Uh, finally, the Sino ends. And I start moving towards the enemy. We uh, we effectively finish off the rest of the Maelstrom fleet. Um, we killed something like 45 Maelstroms that day. It was quite ridiculous. And um, some more of our guys wanted to come in, so I lit a second sign up for them. And um, more guys were coming in. And then in the meanwhile, the rest of the fleet, you know, after they'd done looting, decided that they wanted to leave. So... They were like, okay, we're going now. So I was like, wait, I'm, I'm still here with the Sino. I've got another seven minutes left on the Sino. And uh, one of the directors in Shiva goes, oh, it's fine. You know, the guy that was in the Titan was like, oh, it's fine, just kill him. So everyone starts you know, locking onto me, and I get destroyed by my own fleet. And I was like, really? That, that, that was really nice of you guys. And I was like, I still have rigs here. I need someone to come to the station so my rigs can be brought back home safely. So I warped to the station, and wouldn't you know, there was an insta-popping tornado sat there, and he pods me straight away. So I, I don't manage to actually see my rigs physically, and one of my, um, my corp mates just, he's laughing so hard, he bought the rigs and brought them back for me. So, um, we effectively named it Shiva Attacks Walmart, the, uh, the incident of the day. And, uh, my shopping trip caused roughly 12 billion worth of damages. <laughs> yeah, the, I mean, that's the kind of thing that will happen, you know. You know there's, because it, the best exact example I can give you are the, the guys in Dudreda. Um, you're undocking and you're getting fights all the time. Uh, where we live right now, we're three jumps away from another major alliance that wants to kill us. Um, we're about 12 jumps away from a heavy super capital staging point. Um, we'll occasionally get a titan dropped on our heads. We'll occasionally get a bunch of supers. We'll occasionally go look for a super to kill. It's just something that's always going on in Nullsec, and um, a lot of people will eventually find it to be home. You know, It's not dangerous anymore when you live there. How do we afford this mayhem? Um, Shiva is one of those ridiculously rich corporations, which has got uh, Tech Two BPOs and massive, you know, market stockpiles. Um, it's it's got a, a massive, massive amount of investment in the market, and so it, it actually generates a massive profit. Shiva runs a hundred percent reimbursement on a lot of our ships, as long as you don't do something stupid when you're losing it. And if you're with an official FC, every ship is usually 100% reimbursed. Uh, we've also got programs to help our corp mates make this. And I won't delve into that too much, but we've, we've got means to make sure that everyone's usually above a billion ISK in liquid. And then at the end of the day, we've got our corp ships. Um, if you can't afford our ship, uh, you know, your own ship, there's usually about uh, a dozen to two dozen ships lying in the corp hangar that you're free to use on the premise that if you lose it, you'll replace it. You know, usually it'll be someone else's ship. Um, it'll just be sitting there. We're all very cool with that. You know, we, we just dump our ships there and someone else uses them. Fair enough. If they lose them, they replace them. It's, it's, a, it's a trust thing. <laughs> our website, uh, we are... That's probably better if I just refer you to our public channel, all of our information stuff. 
there's usually some of us there. Um, we can be a quiet bunch in our public channel sometimes, just because we, we get a lot of spammers in there. Uh, it just comes with the territory of who we're fighting at the moment. It's Eve Shiva. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, see, I'm terrible. I'm, I'd make a horrible recruit. Hmm. Oh, like Caleb, no. <laughs> I've already been rejected from HR, and, um, <laughs> Master Akira has made it his pointed mission to let in anyone I disapprove of and ban anyone I recommend. That's uh, just the love we have. Yeah, a lot of the uh, the forum celebrities you see, like Master Kira, Caleb Nellish, um, SW Guru, these are all Shiva folk. There used to be a time where um, we used to consider, like, the, the joking way of uh, referring to Shiva was that where the ridiculously rich people in EVE were snobs. Um, we used to be in the same alliance as Tigrads and Morsus Mihi, and, uh, we had this healthy little rivalry with them, where, uh, we were the space snobs, and they were the incompetent PvPers. But yeah, times change, and everyone moves on different alliances and so forth. Anyway, guys, it's been... And, uh, it's nice to see this, this massive turnout. It was good fun. Um, I will probably be repeating this class in the coming weekend. Um, just for the Euro guys. I know I've got a lot of buddies that wanted to attend this that haven't been able to. Um, I'm sure a few of you have recorded this, so if you do put that up, that's fine. There is also the, um, the presentation, which I will leave up, so that should probably be put wherever the recording is put. I'm sure someone will sort that out. I, I don't personally know how to. And it's been nice meeting you guys. I'm usually on this mumble at some stage. If you want to have a chat, um, I'm usually in the, in the non-Eve gaming section just having a bit of a chill. <laughs> if I ever, if you ever apply. Um, we've got sort of a sponsorship thing going where um, you need to have a sponsor in Shiva before we let you in. Um, obviously that's not going to apply to everyone, so the best thing I can recommend is to hop in the public channel, get to know the guys there, get to know the recruiters, and um, you can still convince them if you're sort of dedicated enough to the task. The, the thing we look for more than anything else is that you're an active PvPer. You know, you have to have that desire to kill things. Um, we generate, on average, approximately two to 300 kills a day. Um, so it, it's not something that is given up lightly. Uh, do we have any videos of our fleets on YouTube? Uh, we don't actually have a video department in Shiva. We're all really terrible like that. Um, there's a few of the old Morsus Mihi videos that you can see us fighting in, but uh, a lot of our stories are more anecdotal, where, um, where you can see really ridiculous kill mails and kind of wonder just what the hell was going on. Hang on, I'll, I'll show you one of those that you can really wonder what the hell was going on. I'll give you two, two examples of just some of the really ridiculous things we do. Ah, trawling for kill mills is always fun. Here we go. This is actually really fun. So there's that kill mill there. Um, we called it the um, the space snobs roam. Um, the basic premise was everyone either had to have a police frigate, which is the uh, the Fed Navy comet with its little police lights, so we could go on a police roam around the neighboring, neighboring regions, or you had to be in a ridiculously expensive ship. Um, that was the basic prerequisite for coming on this little frigate roam, and uh, we basically whelped our entire fleet against one hurricane. Um, the second lecture, ooh, good question, um, I probably won't do it this week, I'll do it next week, that way I have a chance to do this first one again on the weekend, and, uh, from there we can sort of take it, um, once it's up on recording, I'm sure you'll all be able to access it at any time, and, you know, I'm always around if you want to ask me a question, the only time I'll tell you not to talk to me is if I'm actually in the middle of dying somewhere. Alright guys, well, uh, it was good fun.